Okay, uh, well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're very pleased that you've uh, taken time out of your schedule today to join our webcast. Uh, my name is Brad Sales. Uh, I am the Chief uh, Operating Officer at CMEX and uh, very pleased to uh, be joined today by Chris McLaren uh, of Larenwood Farms in uh, Drumbo, Ontario. Uh, that would be about 100 kilometers, I guess, southwest of Toronto here in Canada. Uh, before we get started uh, with Chris and uh, his presentation today, just uh, a few housekeeping items. First of all, I would like to let you know that the audience is muted just so that we can maintain our uh, sound uh, quality as we go through. Uh, you can use the question function. In fact, we encourage it. Uh, we have Peter Van Beek uh, with us today, and Peter is going to moderate the questions for us. And at the end of a PowerPoint presentation that Chris has prepared, we'll uh, take some time to go through uh, some of those questions and Peter uh, will guide us through that. Uh, so if you look to the right, you'll see there is an orange arrow and if you click on that orange arrow, you'll find the question box uh, further down in that menu. Uh, we've also provided a handout uh, section, a PDF in the handout section uh, of the menu on the right hand side of your screen and you're welcome to, to download that so that you can refer to that later uh, at your leisure. Uh, we are going to record the webinar today. Not everybody that has registered, I'm sure, will be able to join us. So uh, we will have that webinar available uh, on cmax.com and you'll be able to uh, review that at a later time. So with that, I think we'll get things started. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Chris McLaren uh, to the audience today. Uh, Chris, along with the help uh, of his family, his uh, father and his uncle, uh, who enjoy maintaining some activity in the business, operate Larenwood Farms. Uh, this is a, a farmstead that dates back many, many years, uh, but in the most recent times, uh, there were some significant renovations done on the farm uh, about eight years ago. Uh, Chris coordinated and, and drove a lot of that change uh, to the farm. And since that time, they have been awarded uh, with just about every prestigious award that there is to receive in Canada uh, from the receiving the National DHI Herd Management Award uh, through to until 2020, uh, this year receiving the Master Breeder Award uh, from Holstein Canada. So a great managed farm. Uh, with a lot of great genetics, and uh, I think that management has been able to get uh, the most uh, out of these cattle over the years. So the agenda today, we're going to go through uh, different areas uh, of change at, uh, at Laren Wood that have led uh, to some of their success, and uh, we'll start our way through the PowerPoint and the agenda. So welcome, Chris and Joan, if we could go to slide one, please. Well, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, the, the herd really, we, we went through some renovations, as Brad said, and, and constructed a barn. I did a lot of touring, both nationally, uh, locally, as well as internationally. Went to a lot of meetings and a lot of different events and learned from a lot of, a lot of great producers. Um, I think that's something that's a hallmark at our farm is, is not only just doing what we do, but also always wanting to learn and be better at what we do. Um, no matter if we're milking 20 cows or milking 1,000 cows, I think that philosophy uh, will follow us. Um, we moved from milking 80 cows in a tie stall barn and knowing how to do that, moving into a free stall barn, and we knew nothing about that. So we tried to learn for some great herds around the world, uh, as well as some quite local to us. And uh, if, if you've toured enough farms, you will see lots of other people's barns in my own barn. Um, I tried not to reinvent the wheel. I tried to just take what other people were doing, learn from them, and 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 carry on. What were some of uh, what were some of the the uh, I don't want to say surprising things, but what were the the key things that you learned in your travels? Well, really focusing on 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 the cow comfort and keeping the cow as the center of of the facility is really really important and key to getting the most from those cows, as well as as keeping things to a 
uh, you know, well ventilated and, and an open, airy barn, an easy barn to manage in is important. Making the job easy to do. If, if it's easy to do, it gets done. Uh, as we move through the slides in the barn, you'll see there was a real focus on, on centering the, the area where we handle cows, um, centering that where all the work is done so that we don't have to make a lot of steps and all the supplies we need are there. But to really look at the barn, you'll, you'll notice uh, as you go through the slides, a lot of cows are lying down. There's a lot of cow comfort. We really focused on sand bedding, deep bedding sand, um, there also is no no brisket locators in my barn. I really feel it allows for the cows to be a lot more comfortable and free to, to, to stretch in the barn. Um, that sand is about three feet deep um, from where the cow lies till you hit any sort of gravel or fill. Um, the stalls are uh, obstruct, there's no obstructions in those stalls. So the cows are very free to lunge and move around as they please. So big older cattle, uh, it was a, quite a happy surprise seeing a lot of older cattle staying in the herd, even if they were a little bit sore or a little bit, um, uh, a little bit off and how they would move around. As well as when we came from a tie stall barn, we had a cell count of, of 130, 140. And we thought that was pretty good, but we came into this barn and, and our cell counts are consistently less than 100,000 with sand bedding and good comfort and, and lots of lying time. So that was those were some of the surprises I think that we had we had that much improvement in such a short time. Right. Uh, can you expand on the ventilation uh, in the facility a little bit more? Yeah. So I I, I like the barn completely open as soon as it gets uh, anywhere around 12, 14 degrees Celsius. So the, the barn will be opened right up. We open all the doors. We have some big fans in the barn as well that come on at 17 degrees. They start uh, gradually getting faster. Um, if you look across the barn, you'll also see no cement obstructions at the end of rows. So that allows for good view of us looking across the herd to manage them, as well as good airflow uh, north to south in the barn. The barn has a, a the, the left hand side of your screen there is the western side of the uh, barn, and that's where most of the prevailing winds come from in this part of the world. So we really wanted to open the barn up to catch as much of the air that mother nature is, is allowing through here. We also, if, if you look outside that barn there and on a previous slide, you'll see nothing in the way of the barn on that side of it. We, we put no bunkers, we put no other barns. We tried to keep it as open as possible so that we get as much wind through there and as much cooling for the cows as possible. As well as we look across the barn, um, you'll see very, very few cows that aren't lying down, drinking water or eating. And that is very important. In a high producing cow, they don't have a lot of time in their day. If you want to get the most from them, they have to be doing those three things. If doing anything, I always say to the guys that work at our barn, if they're doing anything else than that in the barn, then pay attention to that cow. Because that cow is probably either in heat or she's a little bit lame or she's getting a little bit sick. But you can really tell a lot just by in, in my barn by looking across and seeing what the cows are doing and knowing that they're comfortable. Yeah, it looks like a, a comfortable facility. And in the picture, there are so many cows laying down. I know that's always a, a great sign for a manager to see uh, with his livestock of any kind. Uh, so certainly, cow comfort is uh, is at a priority. Uh, if we move to the next slide, we start uh, talking about some of the. Uh, administration and the vet and the breeding offices how uh, anything unique that you saw in your travels that led to design in those areas for you well like i said we, we put that vet room right where we do all the handling of the cattle we don't uh, deal with cows in the free stalls at all and we don't treat cows in the parlor i think it's important to keep those two areas as areas that the cows uh, don't expect to be handled and don't expect to be caught or needled it keeps them a lot calmer and keeps them a lot quieter in the barn and concentrating on making milk. So that area there, the vet room area, the vet and breeding office, uh, as it says, is really the center of everything we do. Every cow that we are going to deal with uh, will get sorted and go near that room. And we have everything in that room we need from, from the semen to breed the cows, to the antibiotics, the hormones, a calf puller you can see in the background there. It's all centered right around that room. So that was one thing we learned a lot from other producers. And one thing a lot of producers commented in their own facilities that they would have changed. You know, you always ask the question when you're designing things is you ask people, what would you change? Not only what, what did you do right, 
but it's always nice to hear producers admit the things that they would change in their facilities. And my facilities aren't perfect. You know, there, there's there's places I would change and renovations we've done um, to make them better. And, and that's that's always important to, to find those, those those weaknesses. Great, thanks. Uh, I think we move on now to talking about transition cows and your calving groups. Uh, maybe just a few comments on how you manage uh, that part of the business. Yeah, so the the stalls, as it was labeled there in a the previous slide, are 48 inches. The only uh, difference there is that the dry cow far-off stalls, they're at 50 inches. They're a little bit wider for the bigger, older cows to, to be able to lie down. And we try and get um, all the animals, regardless of whether they've had a calf or not. And because we're a smaller herd, we have one dry cow group. Um, they're all brought into that group together two months before calving. I believe in, in getting those cows socialized and getting all the stress over with when they're farther away from calving, rather than bringing and introducing new animals into a calving pen right before they calve. It's already difficult enough to get cattle two, three weeks from calving to eat. And by introducing new stresses and new new socialization, um, you, you limit the amount of intake those cows will get. So we try to always move and socialize in, in the far up group ahead of time. And we always move from that group into the calving pen, as you see in the bottom right in the, the straw area there. Um, we move always in pairs, so we always bring groups into there in, in a in a paired group, which in, in lots of research to do with calves mostly they have shown uh, reduced stress, increased intakes, gains, um, and we carry that into the rest of the herd. Um, so we do a lot of preventive treatments there as well. Um, a lot of cattle cattle will get a lot of that. We'll get vaccines and we'll get uh, vitamins in those pens as well to help uh, prevent problems before they happen. We we are a big believer on our farm of uh, preventing fires, not putting them out. I would much rather spend my money and my time ahead of time with those cows than wait until there's an issue afterwards. Um, so we look for where where there's, there's value in vaccines and different products and put them into the cattle ahead of that calving. So it's, it's really concentrated on a, a low stress comfortable environment for those cattle right at calving and also right after they've calved we move them into an adjacent pen and we keep them there for a couple of days so that they they feel comfortable and close to where they had a calf so that they can can relax and rest and i can monitor their intakes and also um see how much milk they're giving and it really helps the cows to to be a lot more comfortable and, and calm that's right chris and i i think the attention to detail you know, on your on your farm is evidence in in so many areas, and we always uh, talk about, I guess, in the industry about a well a well operating dairy farm is much like a, an old wagon wheel with lots of spokes. That there's so many spokes in that wagon wheel, and if they're all strong and functioning properly, then there's going to be no problems. And I think I'd encourage the 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 audience today to think about you know each one of these areas of the business. Uh, you know, works with, uh, you know, right across the business to make sure uh, that maximum performance and, and health and productivity of the cows is being achieved. And each one of these areas is so critical for success. Uh, another area, obviously, that's critical is when we get into feeding. And uh, I know that you use a TMR ration on uh, the farm there. Maybe just tell us a, a little bit about that. Yeah, and I, I just want to reiterate, sort of, yeah, we do believe in, in lots of different areas that are all very, very important, and, and definitely the feeding is. Uh, we try to harvest as, as good a quality feed as we possibly can, um, and we really focus on a high roughage diet. We try and get high high intakes of roughage into our cattle. We breed cattle to have, to have lots of capacity and lots of width to, to eat a lot of feed, and we try and harvest great feeds so that they can do that. And uh, so largely the ration is corn silage and um, haylage based. Um, there also is uh, some high moisture corn added in. Uh, we grow some roasted beans as well and add in some mineral. Um, and then we, we bought in that feed pusher a few years ago to, to keep the feed in front of the cows because they push it away so much and, and eat so much that we wanted to keep the feed in front of them. So very, it's a very important area. Um, one thing I always like, I do like to tell people when I, when I think of cows and I try and Pass a philosophy on to people that work at the farm as well. Is I, I, I treat the dairy cow like she's an athlete. Okay, so the athlete needs you need good genetics. I'm not going to be. Uh, I'm not. There's some sports. 
that I'm not going to be good at because I'm, I'm, I'm too tall and too thin. I was never going to be in Canada a good hockey player because I would just get broken into two pieces because I'm too small. Um, so you need good genetics, you need good feed, you need good management, you need good prevention, and you need a good team around you. And that's kind of the philosophy we deal with cows in really everything that we do. And, and feeding is definitely an important part. How uh, how much of a difference did the feed pusher make uh, after you put that in? Is it how often does it run through? And uh, tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, the feed pusher runs through uh, eight times a day. We try and uh, work that around milking and scraping schedules so that we're not encouraging cows to get up and walk through scrapers. Um, so it, how much of a difference? I would say that I got uh, maybe a, a tenth or more of butter fat because they're not sorting the feed quite as much. Um, and I would probably say I, I got more consistent milk production in the uh, in some of the lower producing cows. Now, a feed, the way I, I like to a feed pusher is similar to bunk space in a barn. Um, you put you you try to build a barn with lots and lots of bunk space to accommodate all the cattle. You're building it and you're installing a feed pusher for the the bottom 25% of your herd because those are the ones that don't get access preferred access. Those are the ones that don't get to eat at proper times of the day. And the, the dominant, big, mature cow, she's going to get what she wants whenever she wants it. Um, but the feed pusher, as well as bunk space, really makes sure that that bottom 25% uh, can excel in the barn. And I think that's where we've noticed the difference with a good barn design, as well as with the feed pusher, is that all the cattle do well. We aren't just seeing the greatest ones doing really, really well. The bottom ones that are a little bit timid, uh, are, are doing good as well. Now, I like a cow when I'm breeding cows and selecting animals out of the barn. I like cows that are aggressive and, and get in there and fight for their their bit of the manger. But they aren't all like that. So the feed pusher really helps with that. Right. Thanks. Yeah. And if we move from uh, this end of the cow to the next slide, we we find the other end. And I know um, you know environmental planning and uh, doing a great job with your crops. Uh, you know, is important to you and you, your family. Talk to us uh, a little bit about uh, your environmental uh, plans and, and manure handling. Yeah, uh, before we built the barn, we had to, we, we put in an environmental farm plan to say how we're gonna deal with the manure in a, in a environmentally friendly way. We follow along with that. We try and use the manure uh, as to its advantage. We try not to, to waste it and over apply as well as we've been applying ahead of things. We, we we plant alfalfa in the summertime, so we've been trying to put manure on before we plant that as a source of nutrients and water, as an example, for that alfalfa, um, as well as ahead of some of the, the, the wheat and, and grain crops. It seems to really help ahead of that. So trying to use it uh, efficiently, because it is a resource. It's not just a waste product, and using it efficiently so that you get the most from it, and it helps with not only the the yields, but also the bottom line of the farm. Great, thanks. And as we move to the next slide, and just before we, you know, begin to talk about some of the performance on the farm, uh, talk to us about your selection of of parlor. Um, and maybe if you want to get into, I, I'm sure you looked at robots at the time too. And what kind of led your thinking uh, in this direction? Yeah, so I, I, did, I toured a lot of farms, robotic as well as parlor, um, different types of parlors. Um, I did I did move towards a, a parlor over robotics because um, I felt like I could get the same amount of information from the parlor. But I, I love milking cows. I really like um, I really like the twice a day. We only milk twice a day, and I do most of the milkings. And I really like that part of it. I like seeing the cows come in. I feel like I. A lot of my management is done at that time. I, I watch every cow walk in twice a day. I can locomotion score just um, just as I'm looking at them. I can see immediately how much milk they're giving. Plus, I have a lot of technology in the parlor as far as lying, resting, activity levels. There's Afi Lab measuring fat, protein, um, and I can manage all those sorts of that sort of data as well as seeing the cows themselves. So. Robotics was definitely a consideration. We toured a lot. Um, it just came down to what I preferred, uh, and I preferred the process of milking the cows and seeing them being around them. So, um, so, it's, so you're part. It's built. It's a double ten parallel, right? Yeah, it's a double ten parallel. So the you know 
less walking. I one, one person can milk in the parlor, um, so it's it's efficient size of parlor for my herd size. I didn't want to put two people in a parlor any bigger than that because it just would be we only milk 100 cows, so it, it's just an hour and a half to milk the cows anyways. Um, so that, that was kind of where the, the decisions came. Now, Chris, you mentioned about um, you know the parlor, and I guess uh, there's lots of sensor technology on animals and parlors, and uh, you know right into the milk lines, these different things. Are you utilizing a lot of that information to drive management decisions, or just talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. The, the data that comes from the parlor, um, we look at the, the butterfat uh, percents and the uh, activity levels and um, somatic cell counts, all that sort of sensor data that comes. Um, with a herd that's 48,000 cell count, there aren't a lot of cows that are high, and the ones that are, you already knew about anyways. Um, and production data and deviations, and, and there was a cow just this morning that was flashed in the parlor as being low, and we put a sword on her immediately and put her in a pen, and and she had uh, some digestive issues that the vet was looking at this morning uh, to solve. So right away, uh, based on the sensor and the an accurate meter, we were able to to find the problem and hopefully solve it. Okay. And then, uh, as far as herd productivity goes, um, let's talk about you know your herd averages and where you've been and where you'd like to go. Yeah, so we milk we milk twice a day, um, and that's comfortable for us right now, just with with labor and and that. Um, so we get about thirteen thousand liters out of the herd, uh, forty one kilo average, as it says there. Um, we've been trying to drive um, not necessarily more liters uh, at, at how do I say this? We've been trying to get more more persistency out of the cattle, so that we get more yield over the whole lactation but have it so they aren't such driving such high peaks at the start and such low low valleys at the end and i find that's an easier cow to manage um, and get more overall yield out of the lactation we've been breeding for fat yield and percent for 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 decades and we have a, a butter fat percent usually around four four one somewhere in there right now it's flipped a little bit lower with the summer it's down to just just low four so uh, we, we believe not only just in leaders, but with our mar with our system in Canada, um, we're being paid for components. So we really want to make sure the cow is producing components, not just not just leaders. So where I'd like to go, I guess, um, that's always a moving target. I, I I think the limits of the modern Holstein dairy cow. If you if you went back 20 years, people would think it's crazy. You know, you, you can't possibly get. Like I have some cows who give 18, 20,000 liters in a lactation. People would have thought that's crazy 20 years ago to have average cows like that. But I, 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 we're just trying to get them to give more milk uh, all the time with more ease. You know, it's about trouble-free cows and, and producing cattle that have less problems and less overall time managing those cows to produce high levels of milk production. Yeah, I think it's a great comment. And really, when you when you think about you know your best cows in your farm and you think geez wouldn't it be nice if all my cows could be like that well maybe maybe 10 years from now all your cows will be like that best cow of today and that really is uh you know i think should be the limits of our objective setting for sure uh if we move along now we start well, talking okay. about yeah go ahead chris i can say what my dad likes to say is the best cow in the barn is one you don't know you have yes that's right invisible cows yeah you, know, um, you have you, you see our number you track check and you don't know what she looks like you know, <laughs> that's always a good sign um talk to us a little bit about uh some of the reproductive performance i know uh you know and i talked a little bit about it at the beginning but uh to be able to receive uh, this you know national herd management award you know once in a lifetime is a great achievement uh you've been able to do it three times and uh you know talk to us a little bit about some of these things that uh you know contributed to uh you and your team there uh winning the award well we we noticed when we came into the new barn that uh, being able to get cows pregnant was definitely was definitely improved uh, seeing cows move around some technologies that all helped but looking after the first few years um, and looking at this data you really you can see where your weaknesses are. We 
we had some pregnancy rate issues in, in over the last couple of years. We identified that, uh, that issue through lots of help from advisors and were able to improve the pregnancy rate uh, up to now 28%. So it's, it's but really the, the, the law, the, the area where you can really make big improvements in a herd, not only in production, but in age is concentrating on reproduction. And reproduction is a good measure that, that measures lots of other things. If you don't have good transitioning, if you don't have good, um, if you don't have good mass, you know, mass studies prevention, all those things that, that impair a cow from getting pregnant, it doesn't translate into those sorts of numbers. And we've had good good success over the last six, six eight months. Um, and preg rates have, have gone up. We had, had a herd health just this morning, and uh, we have uh, a, a number of cows that got pregnant. Uh, so it'll be, uh, my dad joked this morning that he's, he's planning on taking vacation uh, nine months from now because there's a lot of cows pregnant today. So, <laughs> Well, that's always a good sign, I guess. Yeah, no question about it. Um, you know, the, uh, the conception rates, the pregnancy rates, which is, I guess is the best benchmark of that, you know, certainly outstanding. Um, how do you handle, uh, you know, your days open? You know, what is your goal as far as voluntary waiting period before your breeding, after calving, that kind of thing? Where, how do you see that evolving for you? Yeah, right now uh, it's a voluntary waiting period of 60 days uh, for any lactation. Uh, we, we debate about putting the voluntary waiting period a little bit longer in the two-year-olds, but they seem to be handling it. Uh, we've just started calving animals. Uh, as you see, the age of first calving is 22 months. Uh, we started actively a year ago breeding cattle at, at a little bit younger at 13 months. So I may extend the voluntary waiting period a little bit longer on those, those, those two-year-olds just to give them a little bit more time to mature. But right now it's 60 days. Um, anybody that is found to be not bred at 70 days in milk is enrolled on a cedar sink uh, protocol. And that's just standard. That just happens. Um, it doesn't matter if you're an estrus or you, if you have a lot of problems after calving, you might delay it a bit. But that's why if you look at the uh, uh, average days open, why it's so low. If you look at the percent pregnant 150 days, it's because we follow that protocol religiously and cows get bred. We, we, don't, we don't wait around for them to show us a heat. If they're not showing us a heat, we make sure they, they get bred because a dairy farm has to have pregnant cows, so. That's right, that's right. Um, okay, so we'll just move along now, talk about some of the, uh, I guess some of the CMAX tools or industry tools that you're using. Obviously, you know, you're, you're on milk recording and classification and those things, but uh, talk to us about use of sex semen. Uh, I know you like uh, the Immunity Plus brand, just some of your strategies uh, within your breeding strategy. Yeah, so we select uh, mostly for a, a balanced cow um, uh, that has good good overall type, good production, and ideally immunity plus. Um, later on, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the the Elevate program. But we we when we detect an animal that, that's a high immune responder, um, we can perhaps get away without an immunity plus bull. But um, the low ones always get bred to immunity plus bulls and we breed for high health traits and uh, anyone that comes up as a, a number that's fairly high on, on the genomics they're bred to sex semen at the heifer barn say 15 percent usually and the lower ones at the dairy barn here are breed are bred to a uh, beef bull as a way to get milk production out of them but not necessarily the next generation and how how is, has your breeding strategy evolved over time i, I mean obviously coming from the system you were in 10 years ago into the new facility and now that you've been in there a while uh, what has been the evolution of your breeding strategies what's changed um well to, to back up a little we when i decided 10 years before we were going to move into the freestyle barn that we wanted to move into a freestyle barn i started breeding for a freestyle type cow i like rear leg rear view is extremely important to me uh, capacity, uh, moderate size, uh, not necessarily a uh, huge stature, but moderate size, lots of capacity, good health traits. Um, those were always a focus and we've carried on with that. Um, as well as now we're, we're getting much more into the, the health traits of the cows. The overall type is, I'm very happy with where it is. 
and we're not we, we, we select for good tight bulls but we really focus on um, dog fertility herd life uh, disease resistance in general and, and then it's immunity plus uh, for sure if we can uh, if we can get that as well so I, I it's I do like uh, some of the, the, the mobility traits that are in, in the proofs, because I do think that's extremely important for having a, a long lasting cow in, in, a, in a barn. Good, and speaking of Immunity Plus, I know, and we're gonna talk about Elevate here in a minute, but there's been, you've done some genomic testing on uh, milk cows in your herd. And uh, on the screen here, I think the audience will see uh, the cows that have been uh, identified as high average and low immune responders and then corresponding uh, average somatic cells. So just talk to us a, a little bit about Immunity Plus and your use of that. Well, yeah, like I said at the very beginning, for, for me, if I can breed a cow that uh, stays out of, out of trouble and having low somatic cell count is definitely definitely an important thing. Um, so if we can breed for high immune responding cattle, then I don't have as many issues in the barn. I don't need to use as much antibiotics. Um, we're, we, we would love to get to a day where, where we're just not using many antibiotics at all, except for a little bit of treatment. But uh, breeding for that is, I think, a, a long-term goal that we're, we're heading towards. And I'm really pleased by these numbers. And, and with a herd with 48,000 cell count to, to still have heifers that are half that, when they're a high immune responder is is great. And I, as it says at the bottom there, I have noticed, oh, something like that. No, I, I can still hear you guys, so yeah. carry on. Oh, okay, sorry. There was a, there was a, I thought, I, I thought everyone lost me there because the screen went blank. So sorry about that. Okay. No, no, the, the, um, timer, the, the timer isn't up quite yet, Chris. Oh, uh, I, 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 I maybe they put a timer in there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the colostrum quality, I was just saying there, the colostrum quality has um, really improved. We, we test every animal, uh, the calves for, uh, with a refractometer for colostrum quality, and we haven't had an animal fail. And it's surprising to see heifers with as good a quality colostrum as, as older mature cattle. The idea that, that heifers have poor colostrum and cows have the best colostrum is not true. Uh, uh, there are some heifers with, uh, with fantastic colostrum that's off the scale uh, on the, 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 the monitor. And that to me translates to health in those calves that are born and then makes a better generation of cattle that are healthy and trouble free because they didn't get sick when they were babies. So it's all part and parcel of the whole the whole wheel, as you said earlier, Brad, with all the cogs in it. Right. And um, just on that colostrum uh, testing, do you use a refractometer or you test all colostrum before you save it or feed it? Or how does that work? Yeah, so every every cow after they've calved, we test it with a refractometer. And then we will save some uh, of the best frozen in the freezer for ones that are poor or one that if a cow calves at two in the morning, uh, you know, here, I'm not going to milk the cow. I'll just thaw some cloths from out and feed the calf to make sure she's healthy. So it's nice to have some frozen cloths from there as well. Uh, elevate testing, I think, is a, and genomic testing is relatively new to our industry, but I know that you have uh, utilized that quite effectively so far. Just uh, discuss that a bit for us. Yeah, so every every heifer calf is tested. Uh, I routinely do that once a month. Every calf that's been born each month, we test them, uh, send the samples away, and we use the results for uh, breeding purposes as well as culling purposes. So right now, the top 15%, as I said, are bred to sex semen when they're of age at the heifer barn, and the uh, bottom 15% are on the list to be culled if prices are good to to cat to wait and get them pregnant and sell them as a fresh cow, we'll do that. But if prices are poor, then I'll sell them as soon as I can to save heifer rearing costs and uh, take some pressure away from the heifer facilities. We also, as I said uh, a few minutes ago, we, we use the Immunity Plus results to breed for improvement in that area. Since beginning on Elevate, we had, I think at the beginning we had maybe a quarter of the animals were low, somewhere in there, I believe. 
Um, and now uh, with selective breeding and breeding all the lows to high immune respond bulls, we hardly will ever see a, a low uh, immune responding calf born. And so much so that it's actually, you, I, I could count on one hand how many of the animals less than two years of age that are a low, low responder. It's really right. a, a great tool. Certainly moving things in, in the right direction. Uh, you mentioned a bit ago uh, you had used a few beef bulls in your breeding program. Are you also using sex semen? Yes, yeah, we're using sex semen on 15% uh, 15, uh, 15 of the cattle that are um, that are shown to be high LPI or high pro dollar uh, numbers on the uh, the uh, genomic results. So we we definitely are using uh, as good a sex semen bulls as we can buy on those on those animals. So before we get into the questions, maybe what what lies ahead uh, for for Larenwood? What are the the next objectives on your list that you'd like to achieve? You're still a pretty young young man and a pretty young family, Chris. Lots left to achieve. What's uh, what's on your list? I look in the mirror more, Brad. And there's it's more white here, so maybe I'm getting older. So. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the future, uh, we're, we're in the middle of uh, uh, renovating our tie stall barn into an automatic calf feeding barn. Uh, I really want a, a weakness in our operation um, has been the calf feeding and transition period into solid food. I really want to try and get higher intakes in these cattle and get more growth and more gain. And I've seen lots of research on that translating into hundreds of kilos more milk production when they calve as well as an automatic feeder will then taper that milk volume down so that we can wean them at a much more gradual process which will help with that stress and get them hopefully eating a little bit faster. So that's that's the short-term goal and what we're hopefully in that barn soon. Long-term, it'd be really nice to have the heifers in a, a newer facility. We're living in facilities uh, for our heifers that were built for about 60 cows and we're milking 110 now. So we have to really get the cattle in, get them out as fast as we can. And they that's part of the motivation for genomic testing as well as overall improvement is just to make sure we keep the, the density down in that barn. But I have yet to find the uh, the bag of money sitting on the doorstep that will pay for the heifer barn. So uh, we, we haven't done that part yet. Right. One step at a time. Okay. Yeah. Um, thanks a lot, Chris. I appreciate that. Uh, Joan, if uh, you want to fire up uh, the video and I'll maybe introduce the group. I'll introduce the group uh, to Peter Van Beek. Peter is a, a key account uh, management specialist for and sales specialist for CMAX and is, uh, is based in Holland, but finds his way to lots of different parts of the world. Uh, Peter, did you have some questions come in uh, for Chris? Peter might be on mute. Well, we seem to have lost Peter. Um, I know, Chris, we have lots of global, just I'll ask a question here. I know we have lots of global attendees. Uh, Talk, uh, if you can, at a high level about milk marketing uh, in Canada, where your milk goes and, uh, you know, how we're paid for the product here in Canada. I think that might be of interest to the group. Yeah, in, in Canada, we have a, a quota system. So we're, um, we purchase that quota as the right to ship milk to, um, to processing plants. And we're paid on a component basis uh, for fat, protein, other solids. And um, most of our milk goes uh, from my own farm, goes for, for fluid and uh, butter at uh, a local co op. Um, yeah, so that, that's kind of how it, that, that marketing system works. And we, we meet the, the market demand with the supply that the consumers demand. Right. Uh, one question that I that had come in uh, back to the bedding of uh, the animals in your, your free stalls. What are the different options you looked at for freestall bedding, and how did you arrive at uh, at the final conclusion? 
Yeah, yeah, that is an area I spent a little bit of time on, but uh, having toured even before I wanted to build a barn, I, sand bedding was definitely a focus uh, for me. I was willing to put up with the, the, the wearing of the equipment because of the, the stories of uh, lots of great producers about the longevity, the comfort, the lower cell count, the traction, all those things. So I, I looked briefly at other things. Uh, we had mattresses in the I saw Martin and mattresses are, are, are great, but I, I do love the, the deep bedding. And I think any deep bedding option uh, is, is a great way to, to house cattle, whether that's the shavings or um, I really think it's, it's lots of research on that to have a real advantage uh, for cow comfort. And uh, as we said, cow comfort was a, was a focus from day one in this barn because it's it, it what's what translates into longevity and, and production in the barn. Uh, another question here, Chris, about uh, your TMR mix. Uh, we, it's kind of like uh, rapid fire with the questions here, but another question about the TMR mix was, uh, what, what is the basis of that mix from a forage standpoint? And, and have you tried any of the new types of forages that are coming onto the market? Um, as far as newer types of silages, you, you mean different varieties or, or what, what, uh, like yeah, I guess some the, people the, are, the base of the rack. I, I think the base of the ration is, what... oh, go ahead. the base of the ration is, uh, a haylage. 100% uh, haylage uh, and corn silage. It's about uh, two thirds. Uh, what it's about 60% corn silage and 40% haylage on a dry matter basis. And then there's some high moisture corn in there, uh, a couple kilos per cow of high moisture corn, roasted soybeans. There's a protein blend as well that has some some things in it like uh, bakery meal and, and canola and soybean meal. Um, but the real philosophy with our ration is to to space out the amount of energy that the cow gets throughout the day. So you have something quick that ferments fast, like a like a sugar, like a bakery meal, and then you have your 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 fibers and your starches and your protein sources. So the cow has energy that she can draw on from when she takes her first bite until she takes her next first bite. Um, so that you have that energy source that, that if she wants to fuel uh, the, the udder and make more milk production, that she has the, the components to do it. That's kind of our nutritionist philosophy, and, and it's worked, worked really well. Very good. Uh, Peter, are you back there now? I think you're back. Yes. Yes, I'm back. Yeah, sorry. My computer just crashed before we started the answering uh, uh, modus. Um, so there's uh, quite a bit of questions about your low somatic cell count, uh, Chris, because I think everybody's uh, very impressed with that. Um, so people ask them, you know, how do you manage that? And also, uh, what is the rate um, in, in your farm? And uh, since you have such a low cell count, do you get much uh, E. coli? Um, mostly what we would get, we do get a little bit of E. coli. Um, we vaccinate. Uh, um, with the E. coli vaccine. So there are cows that will have slight dips in milk production um, that will have had E. coli that we will never have known about because we vaccinate. Um, so that that is the one thing we do have some of. Uh, we do have a few chronic cows uh, that have higher cell counts. Um, and I should probably sell a couple of them, but uh, I, I'm kind of attached to a couple. But um, I think sand is the real key there in getting low cell count and low stress. Uh, good ventilation, low stress, lots of lying time, comfortable area to, to lie down, and deep sand that's maintained. So I always get questions on how we maintain the stalls. We we level them. We clean we clean anything dirty out twice a day. We level the stalls twice a day, and right after feeding, when all the cows are up, we then take anything dirty out of the stalls. Then so if they lie down again after after they've eaten, they have somewhere clean to lie down. Um, so. I, 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 I'm surprised as well that cell counts have gone so low. Although I've asked, I've asked many people, experts in the field, where where you should go. What's and they always, they always answer. Uh, I asked, what cell count should you get? They always say lower. So there is no target 
that is too low. Um, you can always go do better, and we are, we have mastered the cows too. Um, it's a matter of just managing and calling and and finding those weaknesses. Okay, um, thank you. I think that yeah, I think that your sanity is you know that's one of for sure one of the keys. Um, so what do you do with your um, uh, bedding after the calving in the group pen? So um, um, you know we understand your your cows calve in, the, in those group pens. Do you do, uh, add yeah. lots of straw? How much? And uh, do you do something additional as well, just after a calving? Uh, we try and keep the pen clean all the time. So there's there's if the pen is dirty, we might add more straw on it um, right after calving. But I even before they calve, I want the pen nice and pristine for that calf to come out into the world as well so that uh, that calf doesn't uh, get exposed to E. coli as, as well right after calving because she, she has no immune system right when she's born. So I want to make sure that, uh, that, that she has a healthy start to her life. And that is one other area I didn't touch on is we do a lot of preventive treatments and treatments for calves right after they're born. We give them selenium shots. We give them a vaccine right after they're born. We, we dip their navels. Uh, we do we uh, do a lot of things for them right after they're born to make sure they get a real good start as well as lots of colostrum and good quality colostrum. Okay. Um, some people um, did ask a question as well. So you, you mentioned that you uh, made a major improvement in your uh, prec rate to get up to the 28% currently. Um, could you uh, um, explain that more in detail? How did you... What changes did you make? Because you you informed us you get lots of advisors and try to get information. So yeah. can you describe that process? Yeah. So we we noticed um, about year four in the barn that our pregnancy rates started to go down and our culling rates uh, for our older cattle started to go up. We couldn't figure out why, so we brought in some people. They looked at results. Um, we looked at the BHI results. We looked at everything in the barn from design to, to heat detection to more aggressive uh, sinking and cows. The conception rates in the older cattle um, two years ago were like 15 to 20 percent, um, which is quite quite poor for cows in third lactation or greater. So we, we went around the circle, found all, we couldn't find any answers. and. People in this part of the world, um, we have something, uh, some herds and some facilities are exposed to something called stray voltage. Uh, stray voltage is in this part of the world, there's extra voltage that is commonly in the electrical grid put into the neutral ground. And if it gets too high, um, animals, us included, as well as cattle, will be sensitive to it. And, and our vet, um, who's seen a number of herds this happen to, um, says in our herd with such high production, the levels were, were, were moderate, but like any elite athlete, small things affect them more greatly. We, we, we were losing a little bit of milk production, but where we were losing was on reproductive and conception rates. So we, we looked at every other option and came to this one thing that we needed to solve and worked through it over a year and a half to put in a, a system that blocked this extra voltage from coming in, in my barn. And since that time, uh, our cell counts from when we installed it uh, went in half to, you know, they're at 130, which isn't bad, but they're at 130 down and now they've drifted down to 50. And we have um, reproduction gradually went up and now we're at uh, nearly 30%, which is where we were previously. Um, and that's why milk production is at 13,000 right now. Uh, it has been as high as 14,500 uh, three years ago. Uh, and we hope, and that's because of age of the herd. We called a lot of cows that were old, and now we're, we're over the next two, three years, we're going to have to build that back up. One thing in, in my herd that I didn't say right at the start is that this herd is completely closed. So this herd has, we have not purchased an animal in 50 years. So everything we do here, whether it's genetic improvement, production improvement is done internally. We we rely and uh, have great success with, with purchasing the right bulls and making the right crosses and because we lost cows during this reproduction phase where it was poor we have to build that back up again and i, I hope in, in a couple of years we'll, we'll get it back up again to the 14,000 and beyond levels 
uh, with some better better reproduction and uh, a better conception overall. So that's kind of the story. And it took a lot of, we went from our advice, we had people at, uh, at CMEX looking into it. We had our vet, we had people, had some connections at the University of Guelph. They were looking into it. Um, we had a lot of people looking at my, my herd, trying to figure out why we couldn't get cows pregnant. And we ended up with one answer um, that was frustrating to find and a long time to solve. <laughs> but uh, we hope now we're on the right track and things will continually improve. So that's the long story, Peter. Okay, thank you very much. Um, quite a bit of questions also about um, um, your usage of beef semen, uh, since you use a lot of sex semen. And um, so do, do you use a lot of beef semen? And what is the difference in value between a, a Holstein bull calf and a, 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 a dairy on beef crossbred uh, calf in uh, in Ontario today? Um, we do we do use some in the uh, the older cattle. Uh, most yeah, uh, we use some beef semen there. Extra value. The um, female calf that comes out is about the same value as a good beef calf. So you know the price right now today when they bought calves is about one hundred and fifty dollars, I guess. But I, I you know, and the bull calf is an extra. You get an extra fifty percent or you know or more on top of that for the bull calf. So it, it's worth it's worth doing. Um, if you're in, ex in an expansion mode, you you need to still breed a conventional semen so that you can have the replacements and not have to purchase. Being a herd that doesn't purchase animals, I have to be careful how much beef I do use and how 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 good things are going before I use a lot of beef because you have to make sure the cows are getting pregnant so you have replacements to to feed the herd and the turnover. So there, you know, we, we do a little bit. Okay. Um, yeah, there's quite a bit of questions about ration and additives. So, do you use a lot of additives in your ration uh, at the moment? Yes, uh, we do. We use some. Um, so, all of our our mineral um, has um, monensin in it, um, which uh, we've used that for 25 to 30 years since it's been been allowed. Uh, we also feed uh, some toxin binders. Um, with high producing cows, any amount of toxin in the corn, we've, we've had some, some toxin issues in the corn uh, previously in this part of the world with the humidity and heat that we get. Um, we have an issue with that. Last year wasn't too bad. We could feel a little bit less. Um, we also, uh, we were just moving into a new bunk, uh, so we feed some bicarb and yeast to help them adapt. Uh, that is one thing we feed. We do have a I didn't mention at the beginning of all of this that we have three groups of cows in the barn. We have a, a fresh cow group, which is 30 days or under, uh, a, a young group, so first and second lactation, and a mature cow group. The fresh cow group is slightly different. They get the same base ration as the rest of the herd, but they get a little more yeast and a little bit of more, more roasted soybeans. The roasted soybeans, um, the story there is we had ketosis issues the first year or two in the barn. And it boiled down to just adding a little bit more energy dense ration to the fresh cows to make sure each bite was a little bit higher in energy so we could fight off some ketosis. So those are the main additives, I guess. Okay. Um, and so somebody's asking, uh, you look a bit, bit at your, you know, your, your stall size and uh, your breeding goal. So do you have kind of an ideal cow size as well and a cow weight? Are you tending to breed for more like medium size or? You don't have a, a big big issue with with, with, with uh, taller cows. How do you um, look at I, that? I'm actively selecting when I select bulls. I, I don't select for the the giant high stature number bulls. I always try and select for capacity numbers um, with a little bit of stature. So do I have an exact measurement? No, we'll, we'll audit the, the heifers every once in a while and, and see whether the target that we're aiming at 13 months is the proper size. I don't weigh or tape every single animal, no. Um, the size in the audits we've done, you know, every four, five, six months have been perfect. The animals are of good size uh, when we're breeding them. And uh, the results on the other end when they calve are, are good. So uh, I think the age at 13 months of breeding and breeding for size, we'll delay one a little bit to 13 and a half or 14 if she's a little bit small. Um, but uh, does that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. Um, so uh, yeah, and, and somebody, uh, an area, I know we discussed a lot uh, today, but uh, 
you didn't touch too much yet. Um, so how do you manage your, your newborns um, uh, until weaning? So do you have a specific protocol for them? Uh, how much do you feed them? Um, the calves right now are in calf hutches uh, and we feed, um, I guess, about 10 liters of milk a calf per day, uh, spread over two feedings. And we take them, uh, so they're at that level until six weeks. And then we put the ration in half for one week. And then we wean them, but leave them in the hutch for another week. And then we move them at eight weeks. Um, that's where this, this new barn, I, I would rather give them free access to as much milk as they want for the first 30 days. And then taper them down from 30 days to 60 days. Uh, or 45 days, 60 days, somewhere in there, till they're weaned. Um, just I think that we could get more intake in these calves. It's hard, you know, with labor and, and smaller herd, it's hard to ask people to feed calves six times a day. They're infants, just like uh, human infants, and they want to eat more than twice a day. But with labor issues, we aren't able to do that. So I'm hoping this barn will, will solve that. Um, yeah, okay. They have free access to water and calf starter during that whole time. We okay. will weed them. We will always wean them when they we make sure they get about two kilograms of calf starter intake before we will move them, um, which in some is easier than others. Okay, yes, that makes sense. Um, yeah, we are almost uh, at um, the full hour. So um, I think this is a really good question as well, maybe uh, as a last question of today. So um, you, you mentioned uh, during the um, um, your your presentation uh, when we went through the, the the parlor things that you're using Avilab. Um So where yeah. are you looking at uh, for decision making and uh, what what are the main main parameters that you are measuring there? Uh, right now we're we're using it as a we use the algorithm to give us a flag for ketosis. I use it as something like once a week I'll use uh, keto tests right now to detect for ketosis and then use AFI lab as something in between each of the weeks as a suggestion. And then I'll test the cows that it flags. I don't treat solely based on what AFI lab will tell me. Um, I like to still test them to make sure they actually have high, um, high uh, BHB levels. So that, that's kind of how we're using it. Whatever the algorithm has for, for saying there's a ketotic cow, that's what we, we look at. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I think I give the word back to uh, to Brett. Great. Thanks, and Peter, and uh, and thanks everyone for submitting those questions. I know it's not easy to do in a, a webcast format, but I thought uh, a lot of very uh, insightful questions there. So, so uh, at this point, I think we're going to wrap up the webcast. Uh, two things. First of all, Chris, uh, thank you. And uh, and congratulations to you and your family. I think the uh, the passion and the diligence that you have put into uh, you know designing and building uh, your new setup there uh, is certainly that everybody I think is envious of of the facility. But uh, the thought that you put into everything and the work that you did beforehand uh, I think is is very evident and. Uh, I think you should be so proud of of the Master Breeder Shield, the management awards, and uh, and uh, I think really uh, on behalf of all dairy producers, I think I, I would say thank you for uh, portraying such a positive image uh, of our industry, and and I think you're going to be a great leader for our industry moving forward. So I thank you for being with us today. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have a couple other webcasts scheduled for July as part of the series. Uh, the first one uh, is on July 8th, and uh, uh, Dr. Alex Bach is an expert on calf raising uh, from Europe. He has consulted uh, with many of the, the most effective uh, calf rearing and heifer raising facilities in the world. Uh, he's been uh, involved at the academic and at the research level, at the teaching level, and I think you're going to find uh, his insights into the next stage of uh, how we're going to look after our young animals in early life uh, quite interesting. And then we'll follow that up on July 22nd uh, with a video visit to one of the largest heifer ranches in 
uh, Europe. It's a heifer ranch that is in Spain, and Pepe Ajedo uh, will talk to us about uh, the success of uh, that business and all of the thought and preparation that they put into their standard operating procedures and key performance indicators that really uh, drive success for them. So with that, uh, I think we'll sign off. Thank you everybody for taking time from your day to attend. Thanks again, Chris and Peter uh, and uh, everybody who's helped us uh, get this on the air today. Thanks a lot and we'll see you soon. You're welcome, thank you.